Okay, hey, welcome back to Integrated Rangeland Management class here at the University of Idaho. And we've been talking about plants in the past. This is Karen Launchbaugh. And we're now going to turn our attention to animals. And so today I have talking with us Dr. Lisa Shipley. Uh, Lisa is a wildlife ecologist over at WSDU, so Washington State University. And she does a lot on foraging. We actually teach a foraging class together. Yeah, a so, graduate class. That's great. Good. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the basics of animal foraging. So um, get started. Well, let's just start by talking about um, how the physical characteristics of animals, specifically their digestive anatomy and their body size, influence all sorts of things about them. Um, today we're going to talk about those, but they can influence the diets that the animals can eat and do eat, um, different ways that they forage, and even their habitat requirements. So um, I like to start with sort of the dichotomy between a herbivore and a carnivore. Yeah, it seems um, like that's completely different strategies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then we'll hopefully get into a little bit more about how herbivores are really special and their unique systems. But the first thing that's really different about them, obviously, is what they eat. And so herbivores, of course, eat plants, and carnivores eat animals. And that may be pretty simple, but we need to think about the differences between these foods. Yep. Uh, yeah, okay. So the one thing that's different is that plants are stationary. They, don't, they can't move, and so it's not that hard for a herbivore to go up, and when they try to grab one, they actually get a bite. Um, on the other hand, a carnivore is eating a mobile animal, for the most part, that can flee from them, that can fight back, and can hide. This makes it a lot more yeah, difficult. Yeah, quite different strategies. Um, also, um, the uh, plants that herbivores eat are relatively abundant in the ecosystem um, compared to the animals that carnivores eat. And we often look at this as a trophic pyramid. Okay. Um, and um, one of the questions I always ask is why is, do we have a pyramid? What's going on? Why are there fewer um, herbivores than carnivores? Do you have a good I idea? Know. I you know, know the answer. That. I thought you would. Well, um, and at every level on that trophic period, we lose some energy uh, because it's used by the animal. Also, not everything's digested, so some of it is lost just in, in feces or in manure. And there's probably another reason, but those are I the think main those two. Are the main. Yeah, okay. I think it's supposed to be about 10% of energy is lost at each trophic level. Right. So the producers are the plants, the uh, primary consumers are the herbivores, and then we go to the carnivores. Right, so, right. okay. Great. So those are things different about the food source. Now let's talk about how we capture. So um, capturing is really different as well. So because the herbivore doesn't have to chase down its food and it's abundant, relatively speaking, it takes less time and energy for herbivore to capture its food. We often consider the food item a bite of, of vegetation, whereas a carnivore spends a lot of time. If you think about a cougar, might uh, try a million times, you know, a million times, well, a many, many times, times, times yeah, right, yeah. to try, and they might be unsuccessful most of the time. We often watch the videos about um, elk chasing or wolves chasing elk in Yellowstone and they're often not successful. So the herbivore has high success and carnivore is low in capture. Um, the herbivore therefore gets a lot of prey items per day. They can eat about 10,000 10, bites wow, per that's day. A ton. Yeah, that's a lot. It takes a lot of time to do that. Um, whereas a carnivore, depending on if you're a small one or a large one, you may, a, like a cougar, only eats one, usually gets one animal per week. Yeah, I was going to say, so not even low. per day, like it no. could be in several days. Huh. Yeah, if you're yeah. A, a robin, you might eat quite a few worms per day, but right. it depends mm -hmm. on your size. Um, so herbivore has a relatively high intake compared to the carnivore. So when we look at this, it kind of looks like you shouldn't be a carnivore. Why would you want to be a carnivore <laughs> if you have this much trouble getting your food? Any thoughts about that? I, well, I mean, but the quality of those two foods is different. Yeah, so. that's, okay. that's completely the key. So quality is different. Even though the carnivore has tr trouble capturing its food, um, the herbivore has trouble dealing with it because their food is low quality. So plants are low and variable in protein and energy and nutrients. And overall, they're low. But what I mean by variable is like soybeans have very high mm -hmm, nutrients, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but tree bark is really low. Yeah. So it varies any, a lot. Yeah. And when you're a carnivore, though, if you eat a mouse or a moose, meat is almost the same, very, very uniform. And so uh, it's very high quality. Um, and this is all because of the, the cells of plants and animals. Probably remember back in grade school when you learned about cells that the plant cell wall, ha sorry, the plant cell has a cell wall. It needs that cell wall to make it rigid. Mm -hmm, it doesn't have bones. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have an exoskeleton. So it has this fibrous cell wall where the animal cell just has a cell membrane. Mm -hmm. So, and you're maybe going to cover this, but another difference is that plants can be toxic, but there's very oh. few, uh, there's very few 
animals that are toxic, right? I mean, there might be some ah. elements of them, but wouldn't that be also? Yes, and I didn't include that in here, but we will talk about that later. later in the but, yeah. but yes, that is actually a really good point. Um, and so this cell wall, in this picture, it makes it look really thin, but cell wall can be really thick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in fact, I think um, usually we say that carbon is, a lot of carbon is stored in, in this plant cell wall. Yeah. Um, so what is in the cell wall? Well, it's made up of many things, but the main thing that will is important to us is cellulose. The cellulose is just a chain of glucose molecules, mm -hmm. and you know glucose is sugar. So mm -hmm, it seems mm -hmm. like it should be really high quality. Right, and to, to circle back yeah. to when we talked about plants in class, we talked a little bit about oh, cellulose okay, and good. the importance of that 1,4 bond mm -hmm. being very different in, than starches. So yeah. so uh, once cellulose is made, uh, the plant can't even use it for energy. Oh, so yeah, the, the, our mammal point. systems can't either. So it's a... Right. It's the most so, abundant form of energy on Earth. It is. But it's hard to access. So you've already talked about that. A little bit. Mm -hmm. And then there's also some other kinds of parts to cell. Well, there's lignin. It can't be digested at all. It's um, And a few other things. But mostly it's the cellulose that's of interest to the herbivore. So, um, so if you've got to digest, if you've got to live on that cellulose, you need to figure out what to do. And the problem is, is that first, um, you can mechanically break down some of that cell wall. Um, herbivores spend a lot of time chewing mm -hmm. compared to carnivores. I think about my dog when I give her a treat. Yeah. She kind of just wolfs it down, right? <laughs> wolfs it down. I got a dog too, yeah. Uh, um, whereas the herbivore has to chew and chew and chew and chew and chew. And sometimes they re-chew it. If they're a ruminant, they're going to chew their cud even after they swallow it. So they can break it down into little pieces, which helps a little bit. The other thing that they need is a complex digestive system. They have to have a, a place or a container for the whole world of microbes that actually can mm -hmm. use mm -hmm. cellulose. Mm -hmm. They can actually break those bonds and use it for energy. And they need some place. And this is true of mammals, birds, and reptiles. More mammals are herbivores than birds and reptiles, but they also have them. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about it. But they're, take a look at this set of, of digestive systems compared to the same set of a, a mammal, bird, and reptile. And you can see they're a lot simpler. So um, carnivore versus an herbivore. Yep. Yeah. And you can okay. see that it's it's uh, it's in all the different ta vertebrate tacks that have the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So um, um, basically, what happens then is those microbes are like putting a new trophic level between the herbivore oh, and yeah, its food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're actually using the cellulose and even the the goodies I call it the energy and protein in the cell solubles the other part for energy and then they. Their waste products, which are volatile fatty acids, are used by that herbivore. Yeah, a completely symbiotic relationship. I don't think we really know how it evolved, no. but it's pretty pretty miraculous, really. It is, and it's really cool because, again, we have kind of convergent evolution. Again, if it's happened in a bird, a mammal, and a reptile, and even sort of fishes and stuff, then it's it's an, it's it's a technique to actually live with plants. Mm -hmm. And I just put these cute little microbes oh, in there. Oh, those are the microbes. Okay. Those Got are it. a couple. Okay. Pro, I yeah. think those are Protozoa. uh, protozoas anyway. So if we start by looking at the digestive system, you can tell what an animal eats just by looking at its body. You, you don't have to watch it eat. You can. <laughs> you could <Sorry>. too. <laughs> so we start with the teeth because we talked about the grinding. And so um, these are uh, pictures on the, on the left-hand side of three uh, mammals that are about the same size, but they have different digestive system. The carnivore on the left, if you can see, has really sharp, edgy teeth. There's no flat surfaces for grinding at all. It's just like kind of knives that come together. The omnivore in the middle, it's like a human, have mm -hmm. these butadont molars that are flat, but they're not very ridgy. They're kind of the jack of all trade, but master of none. Okay, but butadont. Butadont. If you t take your tongue and taste, uh, feel your own molars, they're gonna be a, okay. they're gonna be a okay. lot like that. Okay. So they can grind, but they're not super amazing at it. Then the herbivore, which in this case, I think it's a beaver I've got there, has really ridgy molars, and they can grind up uh, vegetation. And, and the far right picture is from, um, this is a deer, I think, but they have similar kinds of uh, ruminants, have similar molars that are real uh, edgy. Mm -hmm. They can use it to help grind up those particles to really small sizes so those microbes can really work at fermenting. Them. That makes sense. So that brings me to... Um, uh, something that a lot of you might be familiar with, and that's Sven from the movie Frozen. And I always like to ask, what is wrong with this picture? Well, I, I don't know anything about Frozen, but I do know what's wrong with Sven. Okay, so Sven, Sven. is a caribou. Oh, okay. So what's wrong with He's, Sven? He shouldn't have teeth on top. He shouldn't. I think that the cartoonists wanted to make him look cute. Yeah. But the truth is, is a caribou is a ruminant, just like right. a cow. Mm -hmm. And um, the teeth in the front, the incisors are different as well. 
So most mammals and a lot of those that eat plants, even bears are an omnivore, they eat a lot of plants, a horse, and here's a rabbit, have top teeth. And they can cut things off really short like grass or they can gnaw on a piece of stem. But ruminants, which a lot of our rangeland herbivores are, actually don't have top, top incisors in the front. That's what's yeah. wrong with Sven. So they're going to be eat things very differently. Uh, they use their tongue. They might use their molars to crop bites. So it's something to keep in mind when we think about their foraging. Right. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah, I know. Yeah. They think that the goat's going to bite them in the yeah. front, and they can't. <laughs> So now uh, let's just quickly go through the, the parts of the dig digestive system, what they do, and then we'll move on to why herbivores are super cool. So all of the, the mammalian herbivores have a true stomach. Um, this is where uh, it secretes the enzymes for digestion, mostly acid and pepsin to digest starches and digest proteins. And the carnivores, uh, I think I can has yeah, a true go. stomach, looks kind of like ours. Um, the omnivore, thats I think that's a picture of a dog. Here's, I believe this might be a pig or a rat. Um, again, a stomach that looks pretty much like ours. We're omnivores. But the herbivore, um, depending on which kind it is, but a ruminant herbivore, true stomach is looks a little different. It's called the abomasum, and it comes after the rumen and reticulum, but mm -hmm. it serves the same function. Of that, you, uh, that function of acid uh, digestion and right. absorption. Right. Well, absorption right after. Exactly, yeah, and, right. It, and it only works on things that, it doesn't work on cellulose, but it can work on other kinds of things. Okay. Then we have the small intestines, and you can just kind of see the relative amount of them for a carnivore, omnivore, herbivore. The herbivore has a lot more for more absorption of nutrients. And then the large intestine can have a different purpose, but in generally it's absorbing water and some nutrients. Um, and you can again see how yeah, different right. they look. Like in the middle, the, it's a pig. They actually have quite pretty big, large yeah. intestines. So. I, actually thinking now that's a, a rat, but I often show a picture of a pig digestive system. Could be, but similar. Yeah. Yeah. It's, they're very similar. Mm -hmm. um, so the question then is, can which animals can digest cellulose? Well, really... The carnivore can't. The omnivore, depending on how much, how big their cecum is and all that, can do it a little bit. And the herbivore has to be able to digest it or they can't survive on plants. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. So just to recap that a little bit, the carnivores and omnivores are called monogastric, one stomach. Um, and they don't have a rumen or a large cecum or colon. We'll talk about that in a minute for that microbial fermentation of cellulose. So their energy really comes from simple simple carbohydrates, sugar and starches, and they can actually use protein as well. They That's can right. use the, the, the carbohydrates and protein. Yeah, so, so they spend a lot of time finding that really high quality food, the nuts and berries mm -hmm. of the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. If they're gonna eat plants, they have to do that. Yeah. And the example would be this uh, swine. And um, humans, raccoons, bears, they all eat plants, but they have to eat the higher quality stuff or just eat a lot of it and not digest it well. Um, so if you want to digest cellulose, you need to be herbivore, and there's lots of different kinds. Some of our rangeland ones are horses and cows, but we've got um, deer, elephants, rabbits, rodents, lots of things. And so they have to have the, that complex digestive system to house the microbes. And we've already talked a little bit about that, but the microbes are going to break those cellulose bonds, um, ferment that and use it for their own bodies and their own production. And then their waste products, which are volatile fatty acids, then can be used, they're energy rich, so they can be used by that herbivore, okay? Mm -hmm. So they can convert mm -hmm. it to things they mm -hmm. can use. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the So now comes the fun part. We have um, three different models of herbivores. I think this is pretty exciting. And um, all of them need a place to digest or to, to house those uh, microbes that do the fermentation, but they come in different places. So the first division is between the foregut fermenter and the hindgut fermenter. So the foregut fermenter is where the fermentation comes before mm -hmm. the true okay. gut, which is a true stomach, which in this case, which is a ruminant, is the abomasum. So before the true stomach, but also the small intestine. Everything. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay. It, it is. And so um, basically in this in this diagram, first the food goes to the rumen and it's fermented, and if it's a ruminant, they chew it and swallow it and they do some rumination. Then the interesting thing is it has to be small enough to pass through this ruminal, I mean, sorry, reticular omasal orifice, and that's a really little restricted area um, right before the abomasum, pretty much. 
and then it goes to the true stomach. Yeah, so they have to they have to chew it till it gets to a smaller particle mm -hmm. size. Yeah, so so ruminants we have, but camelids are are yes. kind of like ruminants. Yes, and they you, are. you were mentioning some other ones that are. Yes, um, so there are other foregut fermenters such as uh, kangaroos and a lot of the uh, herbivorous. Um, macropods what they're called they they aren't exactly the same but they do have a forget sl some sloths some monkeys huh. actually do hmm. so it there's different models but ruminants the, and camels the ruminants are the, are the main ones yeah. yeah okay and then we have the hindgut fermenters and so in that case the food goes directly into the true stomach it's digested just like you and i would with the acid pepsin first then the fibrous pieces that don't get fermented the cell wall pieces can be shuttled into um the cecum um which uh, is one place, and there could be some digestion in the colon. Okay. So in this case, the animal gets to eat the goodies first, gets to use it, and then the fermentation occurs after. We're gonna talk a little bit about why that might be a okay. beneficial. Okay, good, yeah. So then we can divide the hindgut fermenters into two groups. One, most of the fermentation is occurring in the cecum, and the cecum is that pouch between the small and large intestine. It's really huge in that vole that you can see in the middle. Um, it's actually the same thing as our appendix. I think oh, you really? knew oh, that, no. right? Okay. We have so a, we, ours is just really small. It's, right, yeah. and, and that's why people think humans used to be more herbivorous oh, than okay, we are now, because yeah. we don't use it. If you try to use it, you have to have a surgery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and ra rabbits are in that era, yeah. that group too. So, so rabbits have an enormous cecum. Um, the hindgut, the colon fermenter, you can see there's all that saculation in the colon. It's huge. There is a cecum, and a lot of it's going on in there, but the, the colon is the biggest volume of the fermentation. And an elephant is one example, but the horse oh, usually okay. falls okay. into that mm -hmm. category as so, well. So same thing, the, it's the microbes, the same kinds of microbes breaking it down. It's just in the colon, the cecum, or the room. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. yeah it's it. the same, usually the, a lot of the same species because their job is the same to, to break down cellulose. And they're picking it up from the environment. Now, something interesting about the cecal uh, fermenter, some of them are able to get a second pass at their food to digest it even better and to to be able to use the microbial bodies the microbes that are in that cecum their bodies are full yeah, of nutrients that's right. too. They are, they've got proteins and energies yeah. in the, in the actual dead right. microbes yeah yeah so the so what happens with this the uh these guys is called cecotrophy it means eat what's in your cecum and they produce a special kind of feces that uh uh, they squeeze out of that cecum and they, they actually eat directly usually from the anus oh. and they re-ingest it and that allows them to have one more pass at it. So then they uh, get those microbial bodies and a few other things that, yeah. that otherwise they lose because they're... Exactly. Okay, got it. And the ruminant It's kind of disgusting, actually. It is kind <laughs> of disgusting. But it makes sense because otherwise they lose all right. that, that protein. And, exactly. Yeah. Well, and the ruminant also gets to use that. The foregut fermenter does because when those microbial bodies die, they just wash into the abomasum and they get to be digested too. Mm -hmm. So those two groups get to use the microbes for... In, in different ways. Yes. So. All right. Um, so just kind of recapping how cellulose is digested in a foregut fermenter. Good, good examples are ruminants and camelids. Um, they have that rumen for fermentation and the fermentation comes before that enzymatic digestion. And most of them also regurgitate their food several times, rechew it, put it back down until it becomes small enough to pass through that small orifice. orifice. Yeah. And what that does is it delays food passage so that the microbes have more time to use up, to, to be able to digest that. So they do it really completely. Very completely, yeah. Okay. yeah. So that's kind of what this little diagram is. Yeah, you drew a dry that. From I think you drew that. that. <laughs> yeah, so the forage goes in, the microbes break it down, and they consume the carbohydrates, mm -hmm. and then they uh, they give off volatile fatty acids, mm -hmm. and then they themselves, their bodies are protein. They, they use non-protein nitrogen and turn it into protein, mm -hmm. and then they go through that orifice into the small intestines where they're absorbed. Yeah, exactly. So some of it does pass a little bit. So there could be some, there's, these guys usually have a, a small cecum and some colon fermentation too, but the majority is in the foregut. So the hindgut is sort of the opposite, both those cecal and colon fermenters, uh, horses, rabbits, rodents. Um, <clears throat> fermentation comes after the enzymatic digestion. And I already explained this cecotrophic, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I don't know if we need to go it again, but um, again, acid and pepsin first, some of it, some of the fiber that doesn't get digested, well, it doesn't get digested there, goes into the cecum. Others can be fermented in the colon, and sort of the story on that one. That's right. And so in this diagram, I've got those two kind of big um, units. One's a cecum and a colon. And 
Not very many animals have two. They usually have sort of one, a large cecum or a large colon, mm -hmm. even though they may still have those organs, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. They usually okay. have a little of everything, but one is going to be their major okay. site. Got it. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about digestive physiology, uh, foregut, hindgut, and different models. But one of the things that we often forget is that actually body size is super important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Body size interacts with digestive strategies. And this is because um, of this mouse to elephant curve that was discovered in maybe the 30s. Basically what it means is that small animals relative to their size have a higher metabolism than large animals. Um, metabolic rate scales with body size to the 0.75. And so we kind of think about small animals like a shrew or maybe even young animals tend to need more high quality food, need more energy for per their unit, size. Per mm -hmm. unit of body weight, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because of this higher metabolism. So if you're a small herbivore, you need to think about that because you're eating a low quality food. So you can speed up that digestion or absorption of, of energy by first eating higher quality food doesn't have to spend as long a time in the room and digesting and digesting. The second thing you can do is find a way to pass the food through faster, especially the stuff that's not very digestible. Oh, like just get rid of those twigs and stuff. Yeah, get, yeah. So, so that works better when, um, when you don't have a rumen. It takes a long right, time to right, pass right. it through. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're a small herbivore, you tend to be small. I mean, sorry, you tend to be a, a sequel fermenter because you can bypass that cecum and just get rid of some of that cellulose that takes a long time to okay. digest. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, if we look at herbivore types, we can kind of see a, a size distribution. Sequel fermenters tend to be small. Uh, ruminants tend to be in the middle to sort of larger size. And then the colon fermenters tend to be on the very large size. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so it's like the little shrews and mice and rabbits are colon and the cattle llamas and stuff are sequel. Well, sequel. Oh, no, oh I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Cecum is the small animal. Yes. Then, so then rabbits the rumens are those mid-sized, the cows, mm -hmm. and then the really large ones, the uh, elephants. Elephants and, and then some other kinds of yeah. um, large, usually African rumens. I even read things. once that dinosaurs were, see, were uh, colon fermenters. That makes sense. <laughs> if they're big, it yeah, does make sense. Yeah, they were slow and big. And we can kind of, uh, I think there's a little bit of a review slide here in a second. We can kind of go through why the size distribution makes sense. Yep, so here's our review. We're going to go through foregut, cecum, and colon fermenters. So... We'll just repeat it ourselves. A foregut fermenter uh, ferments plant cellulose before the plant is digested. That means that they don't get to use those yummy cell solubles themselves. The, the actually the, oh, microbes, the microbes get to use them. it. Yeah, yeah. The, so the they, soluble pro, car, carbohydrates right. that we talked about in yep. plants. The, the right. microbes right. get first pass at those. Right. On the other hand, the sequel and cooler, they get to use them first. The, the mammal gets to use them yes. first. Yes. That's right. Thank you. Um, the the it, especially if they're a ruminant, they have a very slow passage and a low intake. That's because there's that little tiny orifice that food has to pass through. Purposely, passage is delayed so that it's more completely digested. The other two have a, a fast a fast passage, and the large herbivores eat really fast. They eat a lot and pass fast mm -hmm. because they have an absolutely high energy requirement because total they're big, mass, yeah, total right. mass. And so they have to eat quickly to get enough food. They mm -hmm. might have to eat a lot of food for a long time. I can't imagine. And if they had to wait for it to digest completely, they might not have time to eat enough. Um, so both the foregut fermenter and the cecal fermenter, if they're cecotrophic, get to use the, the microbial bodies for food as well, whereas the colon fermenter doesn't. Okay. Um, so uh, the, the foregut fermenter, is very efficient at digesting the cellulose, but less efficient at digesting those cell solubles. Okay. And the other two are the opposite, just because of the fermentation comes first or the enzymatic digestion comes first. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Okay. You just kind of got to think about the quality of food they're trying to get in there. And right. Who, yeah. So we tend to see the ruminants are medium to large herbivores because they, they uh, have time because they don't have the really fast met metabolism, have time to wait for all of that to be um, digested and fermented. Um, but um, they they aren't so big that they can wait on that, right? That's right. They don't, they, they don't need food. as much food, so they can right. take time to chew it right. and regurgitate it and do all that ch chewing of cud and stuff. Exactly. The sequel fermenters are usually small herbivores, and they tend to eat the high quality food and try not. They don't necessarily ferment as much of it. They let a lot of it pass through. And the colon, colon fermenters tend to be really large for the same reason. They don't digest as well. If if you look at horse feces, it tends to have a lot. You can often see like whole yeah. strands of hay if you look at a sheep it's very finely ground mm -hmm. they're digesting it better um and so the quality of food usually the the ruminant is eating moderate to lowish quality 
the sickle is going to eat high quality and the colon feeder usually can do well on really low quality food. So that kind of sums up ma the main kind of interactions between body size and digestive systems of a herbivore. Yeah, so think about, um, as, you, as you guys try to put this in your heads and try to make sense of it, think about some herbivores that you're interested in. It might be elk or it might be uh, rodents, or um, I often think about cows and uh, sheep, cows and horses. They, they're really different the way that they affect the range just because of their digestive systems. So uh, spend some time thinking about these different critters that you, that you may be interested in. And I might just point out that a lot of the, there's a lot of, birds that might be interesting in rangelands, oh, right, such yeah. as sage grouse and sharp tailed grouse. And I didn't mention it when I went through, but they actually have Sika as well. If you're a herbivorous bird, a goose or something, you have two Sika, paired Sika, and you can do some digestion. Yeah, so we don't so. think about that, but they, no? like geese really are pretty mm -hmm. da dangerous in crops and stuff. And then there's emu and uh, aus yep. in Australia, native herbivores. So They have huge Sika. So anyway. Okay. So think about those. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lisa Shipley, for joining me. It was very interesting. Thanks.